Hello, this is Matt Dean with A-Plus College Ready, and today we're going to work the motion example problems. In this first problem, we have a velocity against time graph, and we're asked to rank the initial velocities for each object from highest to lowest. We have four objects, A in blue, D in red, B in green, and C in purple. If we want to look at the initial velocities, we're just going to read those values straight off of the y-axis. So for example, for object A in blue, this object is starting off with a velocity of about 8 meters per second. For object D in red, this object is starting off with an initial velocity of 0. It's starting off at the origin. The same can be said for object B, starting off with a speed of 0 or velocity of 0. Object C, on the other hand, is starting off with a velocity of about positive 4 meters per second. So if we want to rank these guys from highest to lowest, here's what we're going to do. We're going to say, first of all, A has the highest velocity, and that's at 8. That is greater than the velocity of C, which started off at about 4, which is greater than the velocity of B, which was equal to the velocity of D. So that's our answer to number one. On number two we want to do the same thing with the final velocities. So again we're just going to read these off the y-axis. Notice that object A during the whole course of the problem its velocity doesn't change. It ends with a velocity of 8. We might say that object A has a uniform velocity. Also notice that by the time this problem is over, object B has also reached 8 meters per second. Those are by far higher than the others. So we're going to say A is equal to B, which are both greater than. Uh, if we look down here at the bottom, by the time this problem is over, both D and C have stopped moving. They have a velocity of zero. So we're going to say D is equal to C. So that's what our, pro our answer ought to look like for problem number two. Now let's go a little bit further and let's look at problems uh, three and four. Do a little erasing first. So for problem three, which car ends up further from its starting point? Justify your answer. Here we're looking for displacement. Displacement is the change in an object's position. On a velocity time graph, to find that displacement, you have to calculate the area under the velocity time curve. So the easiest way to do that in an Algebra 1 based physics class is to take the area under the curve and break it into geometrical shapes and then calculate those areas. So for example, for line A, notice we can take line A and we can essentially make that area underneath it a rectangle, like so. That rectangle is 20 long in terms of time and it is 8 high. For a rectangle, area is equal to base times height. So we're going to take 20 times 8 and for A, we get an area of 160. And notice our units here. Our y units are meters per second. Our x units are seconds. So meters per second times seconds gives us meters. So we can say that object A moves 160 meters during our 20 second time interval. All right, so next let's look at object B. Notice that object B, we can take that area Remember, object B is the green line, and we can make that area into a triangle, like so. The area of a triangle is equal to 1 half base times height. So our triangle has a base length of 20 seconds. It has a height of 8. So 1 half, 8 times 20, so that is... Um, one, um, 160 times a half, so the displacement of object B during this 20 second time interval is equal to 80 
And again, our units are meters. Now let's look at object C. Object C, the purple line. Again, we can make that into a triangle. This triangle again has a length of 20. In this case, it has a height of 4. So we're going to say 1 half base of 20 times height of 4. So we end up with C with a displacement of about 40 meters. And then finally, let's look at object D. Again, object D here is the, the red line. Again, we've got a triangle. One half, base length of 20, times height of 6. So if we calculate that out, we end up with a D with a displacement of 60 meters. So we're supposed to rank them. So A is the greatest. A is greater than B, which was 80, which was greater than D, which was 60, which was greater than C, which was 40. So that's what we're looking at on problem number 3. Now problem number 4 asks us about the accelerations. To find the acceleration from a velocity time graph, you need to find the slope of a line. So problem number four says, which car experiences the greatest acceleration in terms of magnitude? And that just means that the direction of the acceleration doesn't matter. We're only looking at the size. And we're looking between zero and 10 seconds. So we're not looking for the entire 20 second time interval. Justify your answer. So again, to find acceleration, average acceleration, from a velocity time graph you want to find slope. So first of all for line A we've got just a straight horizontal line and I'm hoping you guys know that the slope of a horizontal line is zero. So we're saying that object A is not accelerating. Now that doesn't mean it's not moving. It's moving for the entire time interval at 8 meters per second. It's just not changing how it is moving. Now let's look at object B. So there's line B. Uh, we want to find the slope between 0 and 10 seconds. Remember, uh, first of all, we want to find the, the ordered pairs, the points. So at 0, our y coordinate is 0. And at 10 seconds, our y coordinate for line B is about 4. So to find slope, we have change in y. So we're going to subtract our y's. 5 minus zero, 4 minus 0 rather over 10 minus 0 so that's change in y over change in x some people like to say rise over run so we're 4 over 10 or 0.4 let's pay attention to our units our y units are meters per second our x units are seconds so we're dividing meters per second by seconds so again, that's meters per second per second. What that means is that this object's speed, its velocity, is changing 0.4 meters per second every second. An alternative way of writing it, and the way we'll normally write it in this class, is meters per second squared. Now let's look at line C. Now something you should notice about line C very quickly is that line C starts off with a negative slope. But remember, in this particular problem, that doesn't matter because we're only looking at the magnitude. We're not looking at the direction. So we want to find the slope between 0 and 10 seconds for line C. At time 0, x0, zero, we can see that the y coordinate is 4. And at time 10 seconds, we can see that the y coordinate is um, 2. So we want to go change in y, subtract our y's, 4 minus 2, over change in x, 0 minus 10. So we end up with 2 over a minus 10. We end up with c equals negative 0.2.
0.2 meters per second square. And now we finally want to perform the same calculation for object D, our red line. So it has a positive slope in the first 10 seconds. So at zero, the Y coordinate is also zero. At um, 10 seconds, the Y coordinate is six. So we're going to go change in Y, six minus zero over change in X, 10 minus zero. So the acceleration, the average acceleration of object D is 0.6 and it's meters per second square. So the answer for our question, if we're, if we're wanting to um, just answer which one has the greatest acceleration in terms of magnitude, our answer to question number four is D. So while we're looking at accelerations, let's go ahead and answer questions five and six. Question five, what is the magnitude of object A's acceleration between t equals zero and t equals 20? Well, we should notice again with line A, we have a horizontal line. The slope of that line is always zero. Acceler average acceleration is equal to the slope of the velocity time curve. So the answer to question five, zero. Object A has no acceleration between t equals zero and t equals 20. Six. What's the magnitude of object C's acceleration from t equals zero between t equals zero and t equals 20? Well, again, object C is the purple line, this one. It Notice the slope is constant. All right, we mentioned just uh, earlier that the slope of line C is constant for the entire 20-second interval. That means the acceleration is uniform for that entire 20-second interval. We calculated for question four that the slope of line C is negative 0.2 meters per second square. Doesn't matter if it's for the first 10 seconds or for the whole 20 second time interval, that slope is negative 0.2. Now, teaching point here, object C started off with a velocity of plus four meters per second. It has an acceleration of negative 0.2 meters per second square. Remember that when the velocity and the acceleration have opposite signs, that means that the object is actually slowing down. So this object, you can see, started out at four meters per second, but by the time the problem is over, it's now stopped. And that's because its acceleration and velocity had opposite signs. The next question asks us um, which objects move backward during the time interval. And our answer here is that none of them move backward. They all have a positive velocity or zero velocity for the entire time interval. Now, a couple of them, object C, for example, and also object uh, D, at least during this section of the graph, have negative accelerations but their velocities never go below zero. So they're always moving in the positive direction. So again, see, no objects move backward. Eight, describe the change in object D's velocity that occurred at 10 seconds. What you ought to see at 10 seconds, which is this point right here, that object went from having a positive slope which means a positive acceleration to having a negative acceleration. So during this first part of the graph, the object was accelerating. It, had a, it was accelerating in a positive direction. Its velocity was positive. Its acceleration was positive, which means in the first 10 seconds, this object was speeding up. But from this point to this point, the velocity is still positive, but now the acceleration is negative. And that means in this section of the graph, the object is slowing down. All right, the next question, number nine, wants to know what, it, what is the instantaneous velocity of car B at 10 seconds? When you have a velocity time graph and you want to find an instantaneous velocity, you simply read it off the y-axis. So let's go over to 10 seconds. 
And let's go up to the point where that 10 seconds cuts line B. And then let's follow that over to the y-axis. So our answer is 4 meters per second. The exact speed at 10 seconds for object B is 4 meters per second. And then finally, number 10. 10 wants to know what is the total displacement of object D during the, the entire 20-second time interval. We calculated this earlier. Let's go ahead and do it one more time. Remember, when you want to find displacement from a velocity time graph, you want to find the area under the curve. So object D is our red line. And again, we can take that area and make it into a triangle. We need to find the area of this triangle. Remember that the area of a triangle is one half base times height. So we have a base length of 20. We have a height of six. We want to go one half, 20 times six. And that gives us 60. Again, our units on the y-axis are meters per second. Our units on the uh, x-axis are seconds, meters per second times seconds. That gives us a displacement of 60, and it's positive 60 meters. All right, our second set of problems looks at a position time graph. And so we're looking at the graph of an object as it moves from uh, 0 to 55 seconds. And the first question asks us to rank the speed of the objects in each of the four labeled regions from fastest to slowest. Justify your answer. So we have four regions, A, B, C, D. And it's asking for speed. Now, when we have a position time graph and we want to know the velocity, the average velocity, we're going to take the slope of the curve. Here, we're asking for speed. So speed is essentially velocity without taking into account the direction. So what we want to do is go ahead and find the velocity, the average velocity in each time interval. And we want to do that by finding the slope. So let's start off with uh, section A. So for section A, um, at zero, our y coordinate is also zero. And at 10 seconds, our y coordinate is 60. So we're going to say change in y, 60 minus 0 over change in x, 10 minus 0. So we're going to end up with 60 over 10 or 6 meters per second. So for a, the velocity is positive 6 meters per second. All right, we're going to complete this, the same similar calculation for B. We don't really have to go too far here, though, because B, we've got a horizontal line there. We know the slope of a horizontal line is always zero, which means object B has zero average velocity. That tells us that between about 10 and 15 seconds, this object is not moving. So the velocity in that time interval, B equals zero. For C... Now notice we've got a negative slope here. That means a negative velocity. That should tell us that this object is moving backward, or in this case to the left, or down in this problem. To calculate the slope, at um, t equals 15, right in here, our y coordinate is 60. And let's just use 30. We could use any two points on this line, but let's use 30. At um, x equals 30, y is 0. So let's go 60 minus 0, change in y, over 15 minus 30. So that gives us 60 over negative 15, which gives us a slope of negative 4. So c equals negative 4 meters per second. And then finally, in section d, notice that we've got a positive velocity again because we have a positive slope right in here. So at t equals 40, our velocity is negative 40. And at t equals, let's just say at t equals 55, our velocity is 0. So we're going to go change in y, negative 40 minus 0, 
over change in x, which is going to be 40 minus 55. Calculate that out, and we get uh, d with a velocity of 2.67 meters per second. So again, to find the velocity from a position time graph, you're going to find the slope of the line. That's the average velocity. Now, this question asks us to rank our speeds. So again, the sign doesn't matter here because we're not talking about direction. We're talking about the scalar version of velocity, which is speed. Only looking at the magnitude, the size of the numbers. So our highest velocity was A. It was greater than the second highest, which magnitude, which was C. Which was greater than the next highest in magnitude, which was D. Which was greater than B, which wasn't moving. Alright, so question two now. Question two asks us to what is the total distance, what total distance did the object travel during the 55 second time interval? Now remember, distance is a scalar. Direction doesn't matter here. Oftentimes we'll notate distance with a delta s. So our object started out with position zero. And from during section A, it went from 0 to 60, so it moved 60 meters. Between uh, 10 seconds and 15 seconds, it didn't move at all. Position didn't change, so 0. Between uh, 15 seconds right here and 40 seconds right here, the object moved from positive 60 all the way down to negative 40. That's a change in 100 meters, so plus 100 meters. And then from 40 to 55, it moved from negative 40 all the way up to zero, so it moved 40 more meters. So if we add all those together, we get a distance traveled of about 200 meters. Again, direction doesn't matter with distance. It's a scalar. So our answer on two, 200 meters. Now C wants to know what is the total displacement. Displacement is delta x, change in position. Displacement is a vector. Direction matters. Our object started out at position zero. It ended up at position zero, which means even though it was moving, it started and ended at the same position, which means its change in position is zero. To calculate that, you might say delta x is equal to the final position minus the initial position. In this case, that's going to be 0 minus 0. So our answer on 3, 0 meters. Question 4 asks us, what is the value of the velocity of the object during section C of the graph? Remember, from a position time graph, to find the average velocity, you take the slope of the line. Well, in question 1, we already did that, and we found that the slope of section C is negative 4. Velocity is a vector, which means the negative matters. That tells us that this object is either moving to the left or moving downward. Our answer to question 4 is negative 4 meters per second. Question 5 wants to know during which time intervals is the object moving backwards. We might say to the left here. Um, we know that an object is moving to the left when it has a negative velocity. There's only one time when this object has a negative slope or a negative velocity, and that is in section C. So our answer on 5 is during section C, and our justification is going to be because that's the only time in which there is a negative velocity, a negative slope. Question 6 wants to know what's the displacement of the object from t equals 15 to t equals 40. Now remember that displacement is equal to change in position. So we're going to take our initial, our final position, rather. So our final position minus our initial position. So at t equals 40, our final position is negative 40. And we want to subtract from that our initial position, which at 15 seconds was positive 60. So negative 40 minus 60, our delta x during that time interval is negative 100 meters. And that's telling us that the object moved to the left 100 meters between t equals 15 and t equals 40.
Finally, question 7 wants to know what is the displacement of the object from t equals 40 to t equals 55. So that's this section of the graph. Notice it's got a positive slope, which means it's moving forward. It has a positive velocity. So at t equals 40, our position is negative 40. And at t equals 55, our position is 0. So we're going to take our final position, 0, minus our initial position, which was negative 40. So 0 minus minus 40 gives us a delta x of positive 40 meters between t equals 40 and t equals 55 seconds. All right, next we're going to begin to look at the multiple choice questions. And what we can see in this first multiple choice question is that we have a motion diagram. This motion diagram is showing us that we have an object that is moving to the left. That's what this blue arrow here is showing us. We know that when an object is moving to the left, that means that its velocity is negative. Now, remember that each one of these dots, is the distance between them is, is showing us how far the object travels in one unit of time. Let's just say one second. So during the first second, the object moves from here, from here to here. But in the second second, it moves from here to here. Not as far. And in the next second, it moves from here to here. Again, a less amount of distance. And then from here to here in the last second. So during each second, each successive second, it's traveling la less distance, which means it's slowing down. We know if an object is slowing down, its velocity and its acceleration have to have opposite signs, which tells us in this case that we have a negative velocity and a positive acceleration, which means our answer on multiple choice question one has to be C. Multiple choice question two is another motion diagram. Uh, again, notice that our object is moving in this case to the right which tells us that we have a positive velocity. Also notice that during the first second it travels from 0 to 2 meters, the second second from 2 to 4, the third from 4 to 6, the fourth from 6 to 8. It's traveling 2 meters every second. That should tell you that it has a constant velocity. So we could say that the velocity is positive and the acceleration is zero. Now so let's look at our choices. It looks like our choices here, our correct choice, is going to be B. It has a constant or uniform velocity of two meters per second and it has no acceleration. Alright, this next question is a little tricky for some people. A boy throws a rock straight down from the edge of a vertical cliff. The rock leaves the boy's hand at t equals zero if up is considered to be the positive direction, which of the graphs shown below best represents the acceleration of the stone as a function of time? So it looks like all these, these graphs are acceleration against time graphs. What you've got to realize in this case is that once the object leaves the boy's hand, the only acceleration is the acceleration due to gravity. All right, so since the only acceleration can be the acceleration due to gravity, we know that that value is always negative 9.81 meters per second square. It doesn't change, which means the slope of our acceleration time graph should be constant, which means it should be horizontal, and it should be a negative 9.81 value. And the only one of our graphs that shows that is B. Again, this value right here on the y-axis should be about 9.81, negative 9.81 meters per second square. All right, so question four, which of the following represents an object having zero acceleration? Here we have different kinds of graphs. In A, we have a position time graph, and in the other three, we have velocity time graphs. Well, we know in a velocity time graph that slope equals acceleration. We're looking for zero acceleration. So in the velocity time graphs, we need a line that's horizontal, a line that has a zero slope. And the only one of those that, that that's true for is B. So that one has a constant velocity. It has no acceleration. This one has a slope. This one has a slope. 
those are accelerating. Now let's look a little bit more closely at object A, or graph A. Graph A is a position time graph. Remember that on a position time graph, the average acceleration is equal to slope. And during this entire time interval, that slope is constant. If the slope is constant, or uniform, that means it isn't accelerating. So both A and B are answers to this question. So the best choice here, answer C. Graphs A and B both represent zero acceleration. This question, question five, is also tricky for a lot of people. It says the motions of a car and a truck along a straight road are represented by the velocity time graphs in the figure. The two vehicles are initially alongside each other at time t equals zero. At time big T, what is true of the distances traveled by the vehicle since time t equals zero? A lot of people see that at time big T, the two objects cross and they have the same value. What that means is that at this point, they have the same velocity. But all the way up until that point, the truck was moving much faster than the car. Which means, for the entire time interval from t equals zero to big T, the truck went further. It traveled more distance. So the answer is, the truck will have traveled further than the car, and that's D. Now if we wanted to verify that, and we had some numbers on our graph, Remember from a velocity time graph, we can find displacement, the vector version of distance, by finding the area under the curve. If you calculated the area of the rectangle of the truck, and you calculated the area of the triangle of the car, you can see that the area covered by the truck is much larger than the area covered by the car. Question six is also tricky for a lot of people. Here we have a velocity time graph. And it wants to know, over the 90 second time interval, we can say that the speed of the particle does what? Now remember, speed is the scalar version of velocity. Direction here doesn't matter so much. But what we have to notice is at the beginning, at time t equals zero, all the way up until about time t equals three seconds, the object has a negative velocity. But notice the slope of the line is positive. And it's positive for the whole way, which means during this entire problem, the acceleration is positive. So during this time interval, we have a negative velocity and a positive acceleration. Whenever those two have opposite signs, we know that means slowing down. All right, but from about um, time three and a half seconds all the way up until nine seconds, this part of the graph, the velocity is now above the y-axis, which means there's a positive velocity. The slope of the velocity time graph is still positive, which means there's a positive acceleration. These two have the same sign, which means the object is speeding up. So our answer here is that at the beginning of the problem, the speed is decreasing, and at the end of the problem, the speed is increasing. So our best answer here is D. Decreasing at first increasing toward the end of the problem. No calculations involved with this problem. A ball is thrown straight up with zero air resistance. The acceleration of the ball at its highest point is. Whenever you throw something straight up, the only net force acting on that object is gravity. Gravity always pulls objects straight down. It accelerates them at the acceleration due to gravity, negative 9.81 meters per second square. So once it leaves the person's hand, the only acceleration is caused by gravity. The acceleration caused by gravity is always down. That's what that negative means. So our answer, B. All right, question eight is probably mathematically the most difficult problem in this section. It says an object is thrown upward with a speed of 13 meters per second. At what time will it reach, the high, reach a height of four meters above the projection point while moving in a downward direction? So we know that this object is at first going to be moving up. So at first it's going to have a positive velocity. It's going to get to some maximum height where instantaneously it'll have a velocity of zero and then it's going to start to move back downward. So at this height of four meters, it's going to pass it somewhere on the way up, 
but then it's going to pass it again on the way down. We want to know at what time is it passing it on the way down. We're not concerned so much with the time that it took it to get there on the way up. We want to know the time that it took it to get there on the way down. And the easiest way to work that problem is to use one of our kinematic equations. We're going to use delta x is equal to v o t plus one half a t square. Where our delta x is going to be four meters. And I'm going to leave off the units just to make this show up a little bit more clearly here. You want to make sure you work with units. But I'm going to say four equals the initial velocity is positive 13 times the time plus one half times our acceleration I'm going to use negative 9.8 here instead of negative 9.81 times t squared all right we're going to simplify this a little bit so it's going to be 4 equals 13 t I'm going to go one half times negative 9.8 and get negative 4.9 Now to work this problem out, I'm going to have to use the quadratic equation because I have a t squared and a t component. So I'm going to make this look like a quadratic. I'm going to subtract 4 from both sides and rearrange a little bit to put it in the form of a quadratic. So when I do that, that's going to give me negative 4.9 t squared plus 13 t minus 4 equals 0. To solve the problem, I need to use the quadratic equation, which is negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. So if I set that up, b is whatever, whatever's in front of my t component here, which is 13. So I'm going to have negative 13 plus or minus the square root of 13 squared, b squared, minus 4. a is whatever's in front of the squared part, so negative 4.9 here. I'll make a little room for myself. So we got 13 squared minus 4, minus 4, times a. A is negative 4.9 times C. C is the component that doesn't have a um, T with it, and it's minus 4. And all of that has to be over 2 times A. And again, A is negative 4.9. Alright, I'll let you guys do all the algebra here, but when you do this, you're going to have to run this through first by, by going negative 13 plus all the square root over 2 times negative 4.9. And then you're going to have to run it again by going negative 13 minus all this over 2 times negative 4.9. When you do, you get two answers. You get T equals 0.36 seconds and T equals 2.3 seconds. Well, we know that on the way up, it's going to get to four meters first there. So that is how long it takes it to get to four meters on the way up. And then it's going to go up, get to some maximum height, and then come down. The second time is how long it takes it to get to the four meter point on the way down. So our answer on this one, 2.3 seconds. All right, so this next problem um, says a racquetball strikes a wall with a speed of 30 meters per second to the right and rebounds in the opposite direction with a speed of 26 meters per second. The ball is in contact with the wall for 20 milliseconds. What is the average acceleration of the ball during the collision with the wall? So the wall is implying a force, or we might say an impulse on the ball. It's accelerating it. We know that the definition of acceleration is change in velocity over change in time. which is equal to final velocity minus initial velocity over change in time. So our final velocity in this problem is 26 meters to the left, which is negative 26 meters per second, I should say. 
minus the initial velocity, which was 30 meters per second to the right, positive. Sign matters here. If we have a negative velocity, that's to the left, positive velocity to the right, and we want to divide all that by the change in time, which is 20 milliseconds. And we want to work our problems out in seconds. So to change milliseconds to seconds, um, there's a thousand milliseconds in a second. So that's going to end up giving us point when we count, when we convert point zero two zero seconds. If we divide this out, we end up with an answer of negative twenty eight hundred meters per second square. So that means this ball is being accelerated with a very high magnitude in the negative direction. It's being accelerated to the left at 2800 meters per second squared. All right, this problem is also tricky for a lot of people. The road runner traveling at a speed of 55 meters per second is cruising down the road. Wally Coyote sees our fine feathered friend and starts out from rest to catch him. The coyote starts to accelerate at the instant the road runner passes by. In 10 seconds, he just pulls even with Roadrunner. What is the acceleration of the coyote? A lot of people mistakenly think that to catch the coyote, the coyote has to accelerate his speed up to 55 meters per second. That's untrue. Since the Roadrunner was initially going 55, and the coyote was initially going zero, the coyote would never catch the Roadrunner if he only, only got up to a maximum velocity of 55 meters per second. What has to be the same for both the Roadrunner and the Coyote in this problem are the displacements. So we're going to set the displacement of the Roadrunner. We'll just say delta x r. That's got to be equal to the displacement of the Coyote. We'll call that delta x c. Well, the Roadrunner is moving at a constant velocity. When we're dealing with constant velocity displacements, we know that displacement is equal to vt, velocity times time. So for the Roadrunner, just VT, which in this case is going to be 55, the velocity of the Roadrunner, times the time, which is 10 seconds. Which tells us that the Roadrunner ends up going 550 meters during this time interval. That's got to be equal to the displacement of the Coyote. Now for the Coyote to catch him, he's got to accelerate. And the best way to calculate his acceleration in this case is using the um, kinematic equation delta x equals v o t plus one half a t square. Well, the coyote is starting out with an initial velocity of zero, which means that this v o t term doesn't matter because the v o is zero. Which means his uh, displacement is equal to one half times his acceleration, which is what we're trying to find times the time squared. Well, the time is 10 seconds. So if we do a little math on here, that's 1 half times A times 10 seconds squared. Well, 10 seconds squared is 100 times a half. So that's 50 seconds squared times A. So if we divide both sides by 50 seconds squared, we get A equals 11 meters per second squared. So to catch the Roadrunner in 10 seconds, the Coyote has to have a uniform acceleration of about 11 meters per second squared. This question is a little tricky for a lot of people too. The Flash is traveling with an initial velocity of 20 decameters per second. He begins to accelerate at a rate of 20 meters per second squared for 5 seconds. What is his displacement during the 5th or last second? Only the last second. Well, the first thing we want to do is convert 20 decameters per second to meters. We always want to work in meters when possible. There are 10 meters in a decameter, which means this initial velocity is 200 meters per second. All right, to calculate the displacement in the fifth second, the easiest way is to calculate the displacement for the whole five seconds to begin with. And to do that, we're going to use delta x equals VOT plus one half a t squared. So delta x equals initial velocity. Flash is starting off at 200 meters per second times the time, five seconds, plus one half times his acceleration, 20, 
times the time squared. If you multiply all that out, you end up with a delta x of about 1250 meters. Now that's his displacement during the whole five seconds. Now what we want to do next is calculate um, calculate the displacement during the, the first four seconds. So to do that, let's just replace five seconds here and five seconds here with four. So now if we redo the calculation, we end up with a delta x for the first four seconds to be 960 meters. So if we want to know how far he went during the fifth and final second, let's take how far he went during all five seconds minus how far he went during the first four seconds, and that ends up giving us about 290 meters of displacement during the fifth and final second. So our answer here is A. All right, for our twelfth and final multiple choice question, you really need to have a little bit of lab knowledge. This says a laboratory dynamics cart is rolled along a ramp. A student uses a motion detector to track the movement of their cart. At a certain instant in time, the motion detector indicates that the velocity is positive while the acceleration is negative. Which of the following best describes the situation? What you have to know when you're dealing with motion detectors, a positive velocity tells you that the object is moving away from the detector and a negative velocity tells you that the object's moving towards the detector. So if we look at our, our choices, since we have a positive velocity, we know we're moving away from the detector, which tells us our answer has to be either A or D. It also that here tells us that we have a negative acceleration. Remember that whenever you have a positive velocity but a negative acceleration, the signs are opposite that tells you that the object is slowing down. So our card is slowing down and moving away from the detector, which means our answer on our 12th and final multiple choice question is D. All right, so now let's look at the first free response question. A racquetball is thrown horizontally into the left against a wall so that it bounces directly back after hitting the wall. We're gonna ignore any vertical motion of the ball. The horizontal position of the ball's center of mass as a function of time is described in the data below. So we have a data table with all our data. Create a position time graph for the data. Notice that the position is in centimeters and the time is in milliseconds. Question, second question, we want to find the ball's initial velocity. Third, its final velocity. We want to calculate the acceleration, average acceleration when it's in contact with the wall, which is between 6 and 16 milliseconds. And we want to know the ball's instantaneous velocity at about 10 seconds. And we want to determine this from the graph. All right, so once you plot the points and draw your curve, this is the graph you should get. And we can see that, uh, to begin with, in the first section of the graph, since it's a position time graph, slope is equal to average velocity, we can see that our we have a negative velocity, which means the object's moving to the left. Uh, during the second main section of the graph, this part, the object has a positive slope and therefore has a positive velocity. It's moving to the right. All right, to calculate the um, initial velocity, we're going to take the first two data points. Um, and we're going to calculate the slope of the line between those first two data points. And you can see our work going on here. When you do the calculations, uh, you end up with a velocity, once you convert from centimeters to meters and milliseconds to seconds, of about 20, negative 25 meters per second. And again, that means 25 meters per second to the left. You're going to use the same approach for calculating the final velocities. You're going to calculate the slope of the segment between the final two points. You can see that work going on here. After doing the conversions from centimeters to meters and milliseconds to seconds, you end up with a velocity here of about positive 20 meters per second. Question four, ask us to find the average acceleration 
during the time that the, um, the ball is in contact with the wall. We know that acceleration is equal to change in velocity over change in time. We calculated in the previous problems the final and initial um, velocities. And we know the time, the change in time was between 16 and 6 milliseconds. So if you see our work here, using A equals delta V over delta T, uh, we end up with a, um, an acceleration of about 4.5. That E means times 10 to the third meters per second square. And it's a positive value, which means it's acting to the right. The last part of the question asks us to find the instantaneous velocity at time t equals 10 seconds. That's the exact velocity at that point in time. To find the instantaneous velocity from a position time graph, you first of all have to draw in a tangent line. And this is our tangent line. And that tangent line is going to touch that graph at only the point in question, at 10 milliseconds. To find our answer here, to find the instantaneous velocity, we're going to take the slope of that tangent line. So we're going to find two points on that tangent line, and we're going to calculate the slope between those two points. And you can see that when we did that here, we ended up with a velocity of about negative 8.3 meters per second, which means at 10 milliseconds, the object is still going to the left. That's why the negative sign, and it's at negative 8.3. It's already started to slow down because remember it was going faster than that. It was going negative 25 here. In this section of the graph it's in contact with the curve so it's, it has a negative velocity but a positive acceleration so it's starting to slow down. Alright, finally let's look at the last FRQ question. It says the dynamics cart with essentially frictionless wheels is released from the top of an incline plane. The car accelerates down the plane and then continues to roll across a horizontal floor located at the bottom of the plane. Your teacher assigns you the task of developing an experimental procedure that will allow you to measure the car's acceleration on the ramp and its velocity across the floor. First of all, you want to know what materials you'll need and explain how you'll use those. Also note that you don't have access to any fancy computer-based equipment, things like motion detectors, photo gates, smart pulleys or probe wear. So let's answer that part of the question first. Uh, you might be able to do this experiment if you had some things like a meter stick, some masking tape, um, a ramp, a and a stopwatch. That's really all you'll need. Second part of the question, ask us to um, describe the procedure in a step-by-step -step manner that we'll use to measure the acceleration and the velocity. So here's a, here's a procedure that you might actually use. So you could use the meter stick to measure 10 centimeter intervals down the ramp, or really any size intervals down the ramp and along the floor, and mark those with the tape. You're going to release the car from the top, um, and at the same time stop the stopwatch, and you're going to time how long it takes the car to get to each of those pieces of tape, each of those 10 centimeter increments. You're going to do that several times. You're going to repeat it for all the distances. You're going to get the time and you're going to have already measured the distances. Well if you have a displacement and a time, you can calculate velocity. If you have different velocities, you can calculate acceleration. Alright, the third part of the question asks us to design a data table. So what we really need to know for our data table is we need a position and a time. We want to do several trials, average that out. The last question asks us how we're going to actually calculate the velocities and the accelerations. So if we graph the position time data for the car, uh, we can identify where its velocity is increasing and where it's decreasing. Um, we can find the slope of a position time graph. We could get velocity if we have a, if we have a constant slope. Um, we also can use the final velocities and the initial velocities, subtract those, put them over the time to calculate the acceleration. Um, so again, our data table is going to give us position time data. We can use the position time data to get velocities we can use the velocities and the times to calculate accelerations. All right, hope that helps.